Out of the depths I have cried to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. May God bless the reading of his word. On the image behind me is that of Jesus standing on the water, reaching down to grab Peter who has sunk or is sinking almost to the depths. There is forgiveness with the Lord and in the Lord that we may reverence him. So you can extrapolate from that forgiveness fosters reverence. Marjorie Holmes was a woman who was struggling with past failures in her life. That is until she received a letter, a very unique letter from a friend of hers. Her friend had planned an outing with a young grandchild, a young granddaughter. So she took that granddaughter to an air show where part of that air show was an airplane doing sky riding, you know, lettering in, in the sky. I'm not sure how they do that, but I'm sure it's amazing. And so uh, the little girl, she thrilled to see the plane and, and spelling out word, letters and then words and just short sentences. But with the sky riding, she also began to notice that after just a little bit, the letters begin to dissipate and disappear. So the little girl kind of thought about that. And she turned to her grandmother and said, you know, maybe Jesus has an eraser. Amen. He does. We've struggled with our fallen humanity. And aren't we grateful that God has an eraser that's called the cross of Calvary? The psalm writer of Psalm 130 which is part of that group of psalms, which is about Psalm 120 to 134, which is known as the pilgrim songs. They would have, uh, as worshipers would have been going up to Jerusalem at different times of the year, they uh, would have probably sung or chanted these songs in Hebrew, or even uh, the priests themselves, as they would uh, ascend the, the steps going into the temple complex, may well have chanted or sung some of these songs as well. This particular song with this particular psalm writer, this psalm writer knows firsthand his personal sinfulness and his personal need for forgiveness, God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness is deliverance. Now, we can talk about deliverance in, in other aspects, and that's true, but if you don't have God's forgiveness, then not much else is going to be of any use to you. But God's forgiveness, it's like a weight being lifted off of your chest, a burden being taken off of your shoulders, and it's all because of God's amazing grace on your behalf and on my behalf. And forgiveness can only be found in Jesus Christ, true, genuine forgiveness. And that's why he makes it abundantly available and abundantly accessible. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon just try to picture that. It's a beautiful saying that Isaiah has, and it definitely describes the ministry of the Messiah. But let's take a picture of that. Jesus has come into the temple complex, and as is his wont, because he is a celebrity, a crowd has begun to gather around him for various reasons. Some are just, wow, it's Jesus. Let's go check it out. That would be the equivalent if I was in a, a Meridian and let's say David Jeremiah was at the mall, which I doubt seriously, but let's just say he was there. I'm going to go check it out. I'm going to go introduce myself. I'm going to say, hey, can I get an autograph? I know, I know, just fanboy right there, but there you have it, all right? Uh, so some are checking it out because he's a celebrity. Others because they want to hear. And others still because they need to hear. And so he begins to teach them. And there are scribes and there are Pharisees and there are Sadducees who are bowed up like, I cannot stand that man. And somebody has the bright idea to put Jesus on the spot. Somebody goes and they catch a woman caught in the very act of adultery. And you can rest assured that they did not care one iota about her personal decency or her personal dignity, but they drug her and throw her in front of Jesus in the teaching crowd where he's at. And they say, the law of Moses says this woman 
who we caught in the very act should be put to death by stoning. What say you? Just a gauntlet thrown down. And so the Bible says Jesus kind of just stooped down and he begins to doodle in the dirt. Oh, I've heard bukus of sermons about, well, he was spelling out all the sins that were, maybe he did. He's Jesus. He can do that. Or maybe he just doodled in the dirt as if the question had not been asked, but they keep pushing and they keep pressing for an answer. So Jesus gives them one. And the Bible says, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And then he doodled in the dirt some more. And that convicted them one by one. They don't have an answer for that because, you know, let's think about the, the math here. First of all, how did they know who she was? Second, how did they know where to find her? And then third, where's the other party? Because it takes two to tango. If you're going to do dancing, which, you know, I know Baptists are officially don't dance, but if you're going to dance a tango, you usually got to have another person to tango with. So there you have it. Why not bring the man who should have been also thrown down at the feet of Jesus as well? But that's a sermon for another whole time. And so they left one by one. It says from the either from the least to the greatest or greatest to the least, but they all leave one by one. Probably just there's Jesus and the woman in the dirt and then whatever crowd is left because I'm sure all eyes have been on that. Like, how's this going to play out? And he says to her, woman, which can be used as a term of affection, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She replied, no one. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. John chapter 8, 1 and 11. Think about the change in her. In one moment, she gets her life back because she's been thrown down there. She's in utter humiliation, probably terrified because she knows that she could be killed and, and legally killed, even though the Romans officially would not allow Jews to put people to death, but then were they really all about enforcing the law every single time. There were ways around it. So she gets her life back. She gets her freedom back, and she also gets a new start in life. Because notice it says, he didn't just say, I forgive you. He says, go and sin no more. There has to be a change. And I suspect that that woman got up out of, off the ground and walks out a changed woman with a heart of gratitude and, and most likely reverence that she might not have had before. Now, there's no way for us to know in the text, but wouldn't it be nice to think that maybe, just maybe, that this is the same woman who makes a, an appearance at the house of Simon the Pharisee who's holding a dinner party for Jesus because it's kind of a get-to-know-you session, and she comes in, and some modern translate, translation says that obviously she was a woman of ill repute. I will not use the actual word, but you know what I mean, and that her sins, which were many, and so she comes in, and Simon is like, if you knew what kind of woman this was, you wouldn't let her even be in your presence, let alone touching your feet. And yet, in tears of gratitude, she literally is crying on the feet of Jesus, wiping his feet with her hair, and then perfuming feet with some perfume that she had brought in. And he, Jesus makes the statement that the one whose sins have been given much forgiveness loves much. The one who has been forgiven little loves little. And he says, her sins, which were many, are, are forgiven. And he, you know, told her to go, your faith had saved you. I didn't say that that is the woman, but I'm saying, it, couldn't it be amazing if it was? Kind of pulling the two dots together. Either our situation, we find somebody who found the forgiveness of God, and it was and is life-changing. And that should be true for each and every one of us gathered here this morning, that the forgiveness of God is life-changing, a new start, all because of God's amazing grace. You can be forgiven all your sin and half the tick of a clock and pass from death to life more swiftly than I can utter the words. Charles Spurgeon. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impart or charge iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Psalm 32, 1 and 2. Kind of an image there. My great-grandfather who lived on Barfield Street, big, huge drainage ditch. I'm talking about, I mean, like drown you ditch. It's, it was almost like a big, it may have been a creek that they turned into a drainage ditch, and there was an exposed sewer line that goes across it. And occasionally some little t uh, top would pop open and filth would flow out. And so he climbed down into that big old drainage ditch one time with a stick to 
cover that open sewage thing. I'm not sure what it was, and I may be off by a thousand uh, miles on that, but I remember watching him do it, covering it up. Your sins covered, the stench of it covered, the filth of it covered. Praise God. How is it with you today? Last time we talked about the distress of sin and of the sinner and how it's a personal distress and a powerful distress. Well, today we look at the deliverance of the sinner. It's a personal forgiveness and a powerful forgiveness. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. And as I shared earlier, forgiveness is associated with God and it is for part of God's deliverance. It's that form and function uh, side by side if you chose to look at it that way. And that personal forgiveness, we see that the psalm writer who had, while he did not confess any sin in that psalm, it's a prayer song, but he's acknowledging a sinfulness and then as you read through it, he's acknowledging the fact that there is a forgiveness and a freedom that he has encountered. We know that Jonah found a personal forgiveness he found deliverance because of God's grace. We know that David, whose sins were heinous, found forgiveness by God's grace, and they were all changed men. In the language of the Old Testament, uh, forgiveness is the word pardon. You, we're familiar with a pardon, okay? And it also means to spare. In other words, if you're going to be put under a death penalty and it's going to be enforced, and then you are spared, your life is spared, same thing. Jonah was spared death. He had three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, perhaps a species of fish we know not of now, or perhaps, as some uh, scientists have said, a whale shark. I didn't say a whale, although it's possible, but whale shark, big enough they can't swallow a human whole. God prepared a great fish, and for three days and three nights, Jonah had the opportunity to have as what I would use with my uh, students if I were teaching, a come-to-Jesus meeting. Rather, God had a come-to-meeting uh, with him, and Jonah finds forgiveness, and Jonah finds deliverance. His life spared David. He's guilty of adultery and conspiracy that led to the murder of Uriah. And I know I seem to go on and on about David, but that's his life, that's his resume. And he should have publicly been stoned to death under the law of God, and yet God very much forgave his sin. He still had to live with the consequences, and the scars that were a part of his life were still there, but now they had been repurposed, and on and on we could go. The Bible says in Psalm 32, 5, David speaking, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity. It's not just sin. It is heinous. That's what that iniquity means. Heinous sin. In Jonah 2, 7 and 9, When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you in your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Personal sin requires personal forgiveness. One scholar by the name of Benson says it this way when he talks about that verse, if you should regard sin, that is to observe them accurately and punish them severely as they deserve. No person could acquit himself. No person could escape the sentence of condemnation. And yet in Christ, he bore that condemnation. He bore that guilty verdict. He bore that punishment. He bore the alienation and the wrath of God on the cross for your heinous sins and also the little white ones. Okay, there are no true respectable sins. Sin is sin with God, and God hates sin, and he pours out a white hot fury upon that. And Jesus took that white hot fury for you and me on the cross so that you and I might receive the forgiveness and the grace of God and the light of his love. But the Bible reminds us in Psalm 53, 3, for every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Context of that is, of course, uh, Israel, specifically Jerusalem and Judah, turning away from God. But it also means that you and I are in that same bunch. On our best day, 
we would like to think we run the straight and narrow, straight ahead, ah, straight ahead, and you got good form. No, ch no, no chicken wing it when you're running, but good straight form. Chances are we're going to run outside our lane. Chances are we're going to stumble and fall. Chances are we might be like Wrong Way Kerrigan and go the wrong way. I don't know if you know who Wrong Way Kerrigan was, but that was a character. At least the one I remember was from Gilligan's Island. Now, there may be other shows, but basically the guy who flew an airplane, I think based on real life, uh, and ended up at an airport very different than where he was supposed to go. And I have my, my theories on that one because he became, at least for a while, a celebrity. Well, sin makes us a celebrity in the worst possible way, but God's forgiveness cleanses that. It's a personal forgiveness in Christ alone. It's not a case of that we're just praying some prayer to a distant God who, you know, just blankets everything. It's personal. When we sin against God, it's always personal. David said, oh God, against you and you only have I sinned and done these things. Now, he sinned against Uriah, yeah. He sinned against Bathsheba, yes. He sinned against his own family and, and those who put their trust in it, yes. But ultimately, he had sinned against Almighty God. And therefore, he needed personal forgiveness. And when you have that personal forgiveness in Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians remind us, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. For he made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's apply this just for one moment. Because this is all of us. This is all of us now. This is all of us going forward. It's all of us from where we've been. Either we're sinners who have forgiveness or we're sinners in need of forgiveness this morning. And you and I who have received the pardon of God, God's personal forgiveness, that grace and that love and that mercy, not just one time to get saved, but perhaps maybe on an hourly basis in some cases, and to know that God's grace does not have a, a, a term limit. Okay, you only got this much for today, and, and then if you use it up, well, woe be to you, and then we'll start over tomorrow. No, God's grace is abundant, and it's overflowing, lavishly so. But the question is, then, is there someone who needs our pardon and personal forgiveness of them, whether it's deserved or not? Thinking about pardon, there are two ways you can kind of understand a pardon. Now, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but first, it's comprehensive. That means every sin is covered, past, present, and future. That's what blows my mind. It's not the past or the present. That I get. But the future, it's not even been lived yet or committed yet, and yet God in his foresight, if you want to use a good old-fashioned, um, I don't know if you want to say Baptist term, if you want to use a good old-fashioned term, there's that little word predestination that gives Baptist the willies a lot of time. But if you use the word correctly, it doesn't mean, well, uh, God chose and that's it, and some don't and some do. No, God knows. It's like having, the, it's like having a, a playbook and you understand what's coming, even though it's not been acted. I was uh, in drama for about three years at Holmes Community College, so, yeah, each scene had to be acted out. Each scene had its own unique uh, nuances. But, yeah, I knew the flow of it, and I know that that does not do justice to that term. And I'm not getting into deep theology this morning other than to say that my sins, those that I have not yet lived to do, but give me time, I'll get around to it. I'm sure here's the thing, that that, too, is covered by the blood. If there's nothing that is not covered by the blood, then the forgiveness of God is not worth uh, anything but we know that it is comprehensive, a comprehensive pardon. Every sin, Jesus is not keeping score in that regard. Covered by the blood means it is taken away. It is paid in full. Charles Spurgeon, my favorite preacher, said it this way, Look unto him who by his stripes heals thee, Jesus Christ, who has suffered the penalty of your sins and has endured the wrath of God on your behalf. What an awesome thought. Every sin, not not some sins, but every one. And that's true for each and every one of you. And then there's the complete pardon. Nothing is left out. Nothing is left undone. There is nothing left to chance. His pardon is effectual, and therefore it is eternal, and it's new by His mercies every day. If we mess up today, there's grace and pardon for that. If we mess up tomorrow, there's grace and pardon. And that, as Paul would say to the Galatians, is not a license to live your life willy-nilly. Woohoo! Because of the grace of God, I can sin how I want. No, that's not how it goes. Your life whether you're young or old, if you're a Christian this morning, it belongs to Jesus. And you live your life 
which is really his life within you, and you live it his way. And that is the way of discipleship. It's a complete pardon. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13 and 1 John 1.9. Because in one of the Marvel movies that came out, I want to say, oh goodness, I can't remember if it was the first Avengers movie. Could have been, could have been another one. There was a scene where it had the hero, Captain America, with his shield and all that, doing an infomercial. I think it was at the end of the second movie. If you have to even wait through all the credits, they have some scenes that tie into what's coming. Or sometimes they just like to tease the audience. But he had this infomercial that says, so you messed up and you're in detention. Let's think about that. Well, there are going to be days, there are going to be hours where guess what? You and I, we as a church, we mess up. And praise God, we can have a moment to not only think about that, but take it to the Lord in prayer, just like I shared last Sunday, just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Will you have that little talk with Jesus? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9. And John, who is writing to the Ephesian church, okay, just like uh, Paul wrote, is speaking to believers, not to unbelievers needing salvation. The one who conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them will find mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. In other words, if you are the one this morning down in the depths, in the dark and desperate, and you learn that you have a pardon that is free, and you are free to go upon your confession, it makes all the difference to you. You know, God has promised that he will remove our sins. Make sure I get my distance. This is east, that's west. And the reason I remember west, because that's uh, where the tornadoes come from. So yeah, I think I'm right. So he has said he will remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. Now, let's think about the scale of that, shall we? You get on an airplane. Let's say you get it on the Meridian uh, Airport over here. You get in an airplane, and you start flying west. It does not matter how far you fly going west, you are never going to ever meet east. It doesn't matter how long you fly, you're never going to meet east. In fact, you can circle the globe as many times as you want, and you will forever be chasing east while you're going west. You're, you're not going to meet. Now, if you were to go to the North Pole, or rather begin a flight going to the North Pole, that's a terminus. You will eventually reach a point where you start heading south because in that case, north and south do meet. And Jesus did not say that he removes our sin as far as the north meets the south. That's not it at all. But rather, the east is from the west. He used the, he used the latitude of this earth, not the longitude, as an example of his great grace and mercy. In Christ, your east will never meet west in terms of sin and forgiveness, and that should stir a, gr a grateful reverence in our heart and life. But it is a powerful forgiveness. The plague of the heart, the distress of sin, none of that can touch the love of God in Christ and the peace that he gives that is associated with his forgiveness. 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says, My little children, these things I write to you, that you may not sin, and if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. There's no sin. Once it's covered by the blood, that can alienate you or cause God to abandon you. Now, it can mess with the, the fellowship part of the relationship. That's why you need to stay fessed up and prayed up. Don't let you know, time pass. Well, hey, man, I prayed last Sunday. It was awesome. Wonderful. But did you pray Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Was there a time like, I just don't feel like having to pray. There are some, I like to prayer walk. That means I can pray out loud. I walk in down, up and down the hall of the house. Sometimes I prayer walk here. If you come in and you hear me talking, I haven't gone slap crazy yet. Some may doubt that, but I haven't yet. But I like to pray, and I like to pray out loud. I don't know. It's just a me thing, okay? But there are times where you wake up in the morning, and you're tired, and you just don't want to have to really go. You just kind of want to. I just want to take the day and chill. I've got a, I've got a night on a Friday morning. I've got a nice recliner. And, uh, well, but I'm going to drink my coffee, okay? Not going to start the day without it, two or three cups usually. Uh, I'm going to eat something, 
Okay, I'm not going to go a day without having had something unless you're purposely fasting. So why would you go a day without praying? It's kind of like this. You think about dry weather. A day without prayer is a day without rain. You let a lot uh, of those days go by in your life, and you're going to have a spiritual drought, and only the Lord can take care of that. But no sin can cause you to be alienated or abandoned. Keep that, small, that sin list short so that your, your fellowship with God is not affected. There's healing and hope and wholeness associated with God's forgiveness, replacing anxiety and anguish, and it's by His grace. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, not punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward those who fear Him. And the rest of that verse is from east is to the west. There may be some sins of which a man cannot speak, but there is no sin which the blood of Christ cannot wash away. Whether it was the woman caught in the very act of adultery, or David committing adultery and then committing murder, or Jonah just saying, no God, I'm not going to do it because I want to see those people burn, and yet God's forgiveness reaches him. There's no sin that you have committed. There's no sin that you may be involved with this morning that his grace and his blood cannot cover, cannot wipe away. Reverence comes from that. A trembling is always an appropriate response because it pushes us to flee sin, willful or otherwise, and to pursue the Lord, to practice his ways. And there's always that sense of humble gratitude. So let's try to connect the dots and apply it specifically this morning. I tried to give you the big picture from the first four verses of Psalm 130, but let's make it more personal. Your personal pardon. Oh, by the way, language of law for a minute. If you were charged with a crime or accused even, and the governor of Mississippi or the president of the United States offered you a full free pardon, usually unconditional, sometimes it could be a conditional pardon, the moment you accept that pardon, yes, your record, whatever it has been or is, is expunged. It's wiped clean. But if you accept a pardon, it is an admission of guilt. That's why Richard Nixon, when he accepted the pardon from President Gerald Ford in August or September of 1974, I remember that, I was young, but I remember that, uh, it is an admission of guilt. Anybody receiving a pardon, in essence, is saying, yeah, I'm guilty, and therefore we all need that pardon. Your personal pardon for personal sins is only a personal prayer away today. It may be for salvation for the very first time, or it may be for renewed sanctification and fellowship. And like that old gospel song I alluded to a moment ago, just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Will you have, when we have the invitation in just a moment, will you have that little talk with Jesus Nail it down with the one who was nailed to the cross for your sin and for my sin. And pardon is still comprehensive today, and it's still complete today, as it was for the psalm writer, for, Don for Jonah and for David. And that's why we need to stay prayed and fessed up so we can keep moving forward from our mess-ups. Forgiven, that's a wonderful word. It means it's not going to come back to haunt you. Now, you may have the memory of it. You may bear the scar of it, but it does not own you. Jesus does, and that makes all the difference because he is in the reclaiming business, and he is in the repurposing business. It's like antiques. Sometimes you can get, go and antique. Somebody says, man, this is nothing but worthless junk. I'm just getting rid of it. But one man's junk may be another man's treasure. And in the hands of somebody who has ability can restore that and maybe repurpose it so that it now has a function and a purpose again. That is you and I in the hands of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You may need and want forgiveness today. And it's abundant today. It is available today. It is assured today. It may be that, yes, I know you can pray where you sit. I get that. But it may be that the Lord calls you to this altar in an act of submission to His will because it's about Him, not us. And in an act of trust and perhaps an act of obedience. So in so doing, God may, who knows, what if, what if that becomes the catalyst for our revival? Not a revival service. Notice we didn't have one, and I prob we probably won't have a revival service this year. Time has just run slap out. We'll just wait and see what 22 brings. But 
obedience, um, humility before God, confession and repentance of sin before God because of the grace of God, and obedience to Him can be the catalyst for revival in your personal life and in this church life and even in our community. Keep looking to Jesus. Even if you've messed up, again, keep looking to Jesus because He can help you to clean it up and to clear it up. You don't have to give up and you don't have to give in ever to sin. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 1 John 5, 4 and 5. And therefore, we're able to forgive others. That's why it's such a primal need, forgiveness. We need God's forgiveness, and then we need to have the ability and the desire to be able to forgive others. And that forgiveness is proffered by grace. And you and I are agents of God's grace among many things. And one day we'll appear before Christ. I know that gives some the heebie-jeebies, but we have to talk about it as we close. There's that one judgment seat where it's good, where you're not there for heaven or hell. That's been decided in Christ, but you're there for reward. And you want to be laying up treasure in heaven for that day so that when you receive your reward, you're going to cast it at the feet of Jesus in worship. Now, I don't know what all that's going to look like, but it's going to be amazingly awesome. I know that. How you lived your life now affects that moment then. But then there's also another judgment seat. You don't want to be there, and that's the great white throne. Jesus is judge, jury, and executioner on that one. And you're not there to say, well, my good outweighs my bad compared to Hitler. I'm, I'm a saint. Well, maybe by degree, but you're still a sinner. And if you're lost, then that, don't, you don't have that forgiveness. You never, you never received it. You never asked for it. And every book is open. Every word, every thought, every motive, every deed laid bare. And you're not there, as I said, to plead your case. You're there to be sentenced and shown why that sentence is just and fair. And then... The scariest words of scripture I have ever heard. Depart from me, worker of iniquity, because I have never known you. To be cast into a lake of fire. Real people are going there, so never joke about it. And time is so short. Here's the good news. You don't have to be at the great white throne. Jesus paid the price so you can make heaven and miss hell. But you've got to have that forgiveness. But there's a word of caution. Repentance does not mean anything if you keep doing what you're sorry for. And all of us probably tr struggle with that from time to time. So as John the Baptist said to the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the scribes who showed up at the Jordan River, bear fruit worthy of, rep of repentance. The prodigal son bore fruit. He came to his senses because he remembered that he had a father and he was willing to be a hired hand, but he said, I'm going to rise and go to my dad. Dad, on the other hand, in that parable, was on the road always looking for his son and runs to him, even though his son smells like a pig and probably looks like one. And he hugs him, and he cries on his shoulder, and he tells the servant, put a, a sandals on his feet, put a new robe on his back, put the ring on his finger, because this is my son who was dead and he's alive. That's how God desires for each and every one. If you know not Christ this morning, then come to this altar and nail it down. Find His forgiveness. As our worship leaders come, there may be other decisions. The Lord may want you to nail it down by uniting with this church. Then come and, and unite with this church. It may be some other uh, act of commitment by uh, submission and obedience. If that's what God places on your heart, the altar is open. Won't you come this morning? finding forgiveness and it will foster reverence in your heart and life. Let us stand as we sing our hymn of invitation this morning.